Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, June 16, 2015, and this is the week in charts. Well, I don't have a Mountain Dew today, so you just have to. Um, I'll just have to get jacked up on uh, on life, I guess. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often say, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So, what are we going to talk about? Well, we're probably just going to dive right into it. Um, but I uh, woke up this morning thinking about how by avoiding risk, you may actually be creating it, okay? Um, and that's going to make a lot a lot more sense in a minute. So let me just jump right into it as opposed to telling about what, what I'm going to tell you. Uh, anything you want me to talk about, let me know. I've got a couple of late uh, user requests in here uh Dath and I, I see that question i'll uh, i'll get to that as soon as i get through the slides so we'll start thinking now uh once we get to the slides i'm sorry to the markets um if you don't mind just ask about one stock at a time you can ask about 15 stocks but um just um ask about a stock and then um hit return okay and then uh just for now keep the questions on the slides and then once we get to the charts uh start asking about individual stocks okay now, as you guys know or may know, lately I've been doing a lot of writing on trading psychology. And, and a few weeks back, I decided, you know, I'm going to do a course on trading psychology. It's, and I said the holy grail is money management before. And it is. It's important. But the real holy grail is stock selection because stock selection is really important if you're in the best stocks to begin with. The money managers will take care of itself, and also a lot of the psychological problems will take care of itself. So I think that stock that stock selection is is vitally important. But then the bottom line is, without the proper mindset, and without understanding the methodology and understanding the money management fully, you're not going to do the right thing, or you may be inclined to do the right the wrong thing, or you might misunderstand what should actually be done and in life things are a certain way but in markets things aren't you're dealing with the emotions of others and of course your own emotions we're using the charts to read the emotions of others to understand what's going on but then we have to embrace our own emotions and control our own ego in the process and in life we seek Cuffing. We want to make sure things are good for us and our family, our shelter, make sure we have some shelter, all those Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs type of things as freshman psychology rears its ugly head. And unfortunately in markets, sometimes you have to do just the opposite. It could be a little counterintuitive. And by seeking comfort and by trying to avoid risk, you are often creating it. OK, so if you're if you don't trade volatile stocks, well, you might actually be creating losses for yourself. Because something bad could still happen in a non volatile stock. And also you, you might be missing a lot of potential opportunities because you're doing this. And I'm going to flesh this out in a lot of detail and in, uh, in just one second. So. Oops. One of the most common things that I receive is your stops are too loose. And ironically, yesterday or day before, I got an email telling me just that. Almost daily, I get a, an email telling me this. Oh, I can't trade with the stock with the stop that loose. Well, as you're soon going to see, stops must be placed outside of the normal volatility of the market. Anything tighter is going to virtually guarantee you a loss and that's going to make a lot more sense in just one second well the other thing that i receive quite often is your stocks are too volatile and i'm going to pick this apart in a second too now some of these slides i covered back in 2013 uh, some of you guys uh, may remember and i'll try to get some of those old shows up a lot of good information those old shows um there's some problems with the codex and all getting those things uh, uh, up to YouTube, but I'll, I'll work to get those up. So the thing is, 
your stocks are too volatile. Well, what good is a stock that doesn't move? And a good fisherman knows that you want to fish when the tide is moving. And the reason, for those of you who aren't, aren't big fishermen, if you've ever gone fishing and the tide's not moving, most of the time the fish aren't biting. And the reason is because when the tide's moving, the little bait fish get caught in the tide and they get carried along and they get caught in that tide and the fish are able to swim and eat the little fish. So that's for those of you who are always wondering, you really want to fish. I don't understand these fishermen that get up the crack of dawn and go fishing. <laughs> you know, look at a tide chart the night before. You might get to sleep till noon <laughs> because the tide might not turn until one o'clock. But a good fisherman doesn't just go out any time. I mean, what's what's the old saying? Teach him, give a man the fish, he eats for a day. Teach a man how to fish, he'll sit in a boat and drink beer all day. So, yeah, if your goal is to sit in a boat and drink beer all day, then by all means, uh, get out there whenever you want. The sooner the better. Uh, sounds good to me. But if you want to catch fish, you need to fish where, where and when the tide is moving. I say where because they're, if you're out in the middle of the ocean, a moving tide doesn't really make a big difference. But if you're, the water's coming out of some sort of bay or estuary or whatever, and it narrows at a certain point, that's where your most fish are going to be. So fish where and where the tide is moving. Same thing goes for stocks. You want to trade in a stock that's moving. And as a momentum player, that should be pretty obvious. But to a lot of people, it's not. And I'm going to show you a slide here in just one second where it's, to me, it's obvious. But what do I know, right? I'm just a trend following moron. But not only should it be moving, it should be volatile enough. It should move enough to make trading worthwhile. So it's better the devil you know, as I often preach, when it comes to volatility. Within reason. Now, I'd much rather trade a more volatile stock than a less volatile stock, but within reason. The volatility, a volatile market also has to have some structure to it. And this will all make a lot of sense in a few minutes. Um, people often say things like, uh, well, I've read that your goal should be, I should have this in quotes, you know, your goal should be three times your risk or your money management has a negative expectancy. Okay. Well, these statistic things work great on paper, but in reality, not so much. Now, let's take a look at a chart here. Just at the last minute, I decided a little exercise would be kind of fun to do. And uh, what I did was I just I grabbed the chart. And as you can see, I don't have the scaling or I took the scaling off of this. You can see the time down here but I took the scaling off. So the question is, would you buy this stock? Well, would you? Well, let's have a look at it. It's kind of basing back here, not a whole lot going on, but it did gap higher. Okay, well, that's, that's a good thing. And you can see it kind of based in here, it did begin to take off, pull back a little bit, but as a general statement, let's take a look at this. It's beginning to work its way higher. And then it has begun to accelerate higher. And it pulls back. So I would say yes. But a lot of people, if they saw the scaling over here, and they saw that that was a 50% move higher, or whatever the case it may be, and if they saw that these bars were five-point bars or six-point bars, they would think, well, maybe it's too volatile for me to trade. Well, what difference does it make? A chart is a chart is a chart. If the structure is there, then so what if it's volatile? And if it is volatile, even better. Now, we covered this a couple of years ago, like I said, it's so funny. It seems like it was just yesterday, and I looked at my slides. It was actually 2013, which is crazy. But I got a few. Um, the emails were kind of stacking up about negative expectancy and risk versus reward and things like that. And uh, like I said, I'll try to get that. I was I was actually watching the presentation this morning when I woke up, and I thought it was pretty good, if I say so myself. So, I'll, again, I'll try to get that uploaded to YouTube for you. 
And it's, it's, I went into a lot more detail than I'm going to go into it today. I'm just going to kind of skim over it since it's been covered before. But let's say you have a high reward and then a low, and I've got a question mark here, risk type of system. So RI is going to be our risk, and RW is going to be our reward. So let's say we're going to risk one unit, whatever that may be, to make three units. So if we risk one point, we make three points. That sounds pretty good because let's say you, you have a winning trade. Let's put a plus here. You could be wrong three times in a row and still break even. Okay. Unfortunately, though, if you just boil everything down and look at volatility of a market, or even just, you don't even have to call it volatility, how much a market moves. A market is much more likely to move one point than it is to move three points or one unit as opposed to three units, whatever those units could be, it doesn't matter. But let's just call them points. Now, Timing does help if you get your timing right, but as we'll see in just a few minutes, even if your timing isn't exactly perfect, or I'm sorry, even if your timing is perfect, you're still going to have some adverse moves against you. A market doesn't only move in your favor. So I would argue, in fact, it's a fact, you're three times as likely to get this to get hit, okay, as this to happen that's just that's almost a fact it is a fact now some people might say well what if uh we you know we got this very accurate system over here and yeah you're three times as likely to get rewarded but your risk is three times as big so this might let's say this system is um i don't know 80 or 90 percent accurate that's pretty good right well it sounds pretty good on paper except for if you get a lot losing trade you're minus three so now you've got to have one two three losing trades in a row just to get to break even let's say you had a bad streak where you had three losing trades in a row i mean it could happen and it will happen sooner or later in your career so now you've got to make nine winning trades just to get back to break even and i'm not going to get into the statistics of that but statistically that's going to be pretty tough even with a high percentage correct system maybe somebody could do the math for me let's say you're 80 percent correct which is pretty darn impressive so these high accurate highly accurate systems so to speak people get really excited about them Oh, it's 90% correct. Look at that. Ooh. And I, I wish I would have, um, I've got a really good note capture pro, note uh, program now where I just capture these screen grabs and throw them into the note program. It's called uh, Evernote. I love the package. It's just really cool. Check it out if you get a chance. And I wish I would have grabbed the screen so I would have the, this wonderful example I could show you. But somebody out there, about the time, a couple of years ago, when I was doing this first presentation on this risk versus reward, the first of many, I should say, but one of them, I should say, somebody had like a 90% correct day trading system, and they showed you all these wonderful results, but they didn't point out or highlight the fact that over a four-day period, they had a 50 percent drawdown now for those of you who've been trading for a while if you lose 50 percent of your account for all intents and purposes you're pretty much blown up first of all it's going to take 100 percent gains just to get back to break even and that's very difficult to make 100 percent in the market okay it could happen but it doesn't those type of moves don't come along every day so yeah, the system is 90% accurate, but what they fail to mention is occasionally it blows up. So everyone out there is all excited. Ooh, let's get this. Yeah, I want to. 
push a button, get a peanut. I, I, I want this income, this passive income system. And it just doesn't work that way. It's like, um, you know, that's not how it works, Beatrice. That's not how any of this works. So by seeking the comfort of that constant reward, ooh, each month I'm going to make so much. That's going to be great. I'm going to make this passive income by, by not doing anything. I'm going to buy this guy's system and make all this money. Well, if you had a system that could guarantee you that passive income, then you'd be foolish to, to make it public or sell it, okay? Now, I make my stuff public, and it's the same stuff I use, and so far it hasn't hurt anything. And the reason that it continues to work is because sometimes it don't. And I guess if I achieve my job of convincing enough people that my stuff works, then it would no longer work. But human nature rears its ugly head. People try to make something out of something that's not there. In other words, they try to find a setup where there really is none. And I'll show you that in a minute. They try to beat the system by getting in early, by staying around late, by exiting winners too soon. And the list goes on and on and on. But there is no mechanical or a passive income system that's going to give you any type of guaranteed return. So you have to position yourself where you can keep risk in line, but you still have the potential for unlimited reward. So this is where the this is where I beat the negative expectancy. Now this is an old slide, but these are a couple of good examples that you can see in here. And yeah, on the initial trade, we're risking one, okay? And then we're actually really taking off one half if you think about it. So we're risking 2% per trade. And as soon as we have that gain, okay? So let's say we risk five points. As soon as we're up five points, we're taking off half of that trade or 1%. So really, if you do look at the risk, if we're risking one, we're actually taking off half of that at the initial profit target. So yeah, if all you ever got was you know, the trade stopped there and stopped, okay? And then you had another trade there and stopped. And then, of course, you're going to have some losing trades. So let's say it rallies up. And it stops you out. So now you've got two times the loss here. One gain, one gain, zero, zero. Okay. So now you would need two more of these winning trades to make up for just this one loss. So yes, if all you ever got was that first half out of a trade, then this type of money management where you're taking off half your profits at 100%, I'm sorry, at, at, your, at your initial profit target would have a negative expectancy. The real buddy comes in on the second loaf because you're positioning yourself, easy for me to say, <laughs> Sounds like a, I sound like one of the Californians. What are you, what are you doing, Stuart? <laughs> but you have to position yourself with limited losses and potentially unlimited gains. And this is why I always preach, never quit at 50% because you'll never make 100% on a trade. Never quit at 100% because you'll never make 200. Never quit at 200 because you never make 400 if you quit at 200, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, you're not going to make infinity, but that's the goal. You want to make as much money as possible on that second loaf of the trade. And this is how you beat the negative expectancy. This is the CLDX. It's one of my favorite examples. I'm going to pull it up in a minute here. And you can see that... This gain here was 4.4 times your initial risk. So your reward was 4.4 times. Plus, you got another one here on the first loaf. So you got another one. So overall, you got 5.4 times your initial risk. So that's not a bad trade, at least five times the amount you were risking. 
Now, getting to any questions on expectancy and how that works, okay? So we, we're trying to get that swing trade. We get the stop to break even, and then we hang on for what hopefully will turn into a longer-term trade. Now, before we get into this stops, let me, let's just pop it to the portfolio for one second. And I guess this one dipped back into the negative column. So the portfolio doesn't look as good as it did. Uh, Money-wise, it looks much better than it did a few days ago. But guess what? The accuracy went down. So what? I would rather this number go way up. I want to see this number 10 times the amount here. And I could, I could give a flip what happens here. I don't care if I have a bunch of losses in here. As long as this number is big or grows okay so this is where being right versus making money comes into play many people would rather be right than make money and they get pretty tripped up in things by thinking okay well i could have that risk to reward one to three boy that sounds good that that that'd be pretty cool you know or i could be right 90 percent of the time Okay, so by seeking that comfort, either a constant reward or a perceived three to one type of edge, you really feel like, well, I, I'm, this is going to work and, and I'm going to make a lot of money and everything's going to be fine. But the reality is by seeking this comfort, you may actually be creating risk. Now, let's take a look at stop placement. Let's just assume that a market goes up and down, okay? And I just kind of drew something in here. So if we're measuring the volatility of this market, and let's say that X is the observed volatility. Now, I use the word observed. And we could also call it historical volatility or however you want to measure it. Notice that the historical volatility, HV, the H stands for historical because that's what happened historically. And then I like to um, eyeball volatility. So we observe the volatility of the market. We don't know what the future volatility will be, but we have a pretty good idea that if a market is moving around X, there's a pretty good chance it's continue to move around at least X, okay? And if our stop is within X, within the normal volatility of the market, it's going to get hit, okay? If you're short, it'll get hit up there. If you're long, it'll get hit here, okay? So you could see there's a much better than average chance you're going to get taken out. And by the way, getting back to that accuracy thing, I'm just kind of thinking about this. If markets were normally distributed well first of all that's a stupid hypothetical question because i mean well of course what would the world be without hypothetical questions but if the markets were normally distributed in other words if they adhered to statistics then whoever had the biggest computer or knew the most about and or knew the most about statistics would would beat the market but there are no hard and fast rules when it comes to t statistics if anything there's a black swan thing out there, and Tlaib wrote about this and coined the phrase black swan, which was a brilliant way of putting it. And it's been pointed out long before Tlaib that markets aren't normally distributed, and they have the so-called fat tail. And if you look at the, the crashes throughout history, if the markets were normally distributed, we shouldn't have as many crashes as we do. We shouldn't have these big outlier moves, okay? or as many of them as we do. In fact, actually, as a, a CTA friend of mine many years ago once said, we're actually playing for the outlier. We're actually looking to, we're black swan hunting, as I often talk about and write about. So the point I'm trying to get to, believe it or not, I do have one, is that if you knew with absolute certainty that a market would adhere to a certain statistic, okay, a certain percent correct, and it would always be that certain percent correct statistically, then you would own the world. The casino industry has, I think, less than a half a percent edge. Now, I know slot machines are much worse, 
but or better for them if you look at it that way and that's why it's so many slot machines but if you look at the big money and the big gambling that edge is very 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 tiny but it's a trillion dollar plus industry maybe even a multi-trillion dollar industry why well because they know they have an edge and they know they might have a bad streak but longer term they're going to win in the end so everyone tries to quantify trading and say I, I need to know how many percent correct i can't tell you that i don't know i don't know when my next big winner is going to come along but i know if i position myself properly and do the right stock selection i have a chance okay a better than average chance that i'm going to do quite well longer term i can't quantify that if i could then we should you know or anyone could you should take all your assets and put them into the market and just you have this beautiful little machine that just prints the money okay i don't want to make it sound too elusive but you have to go in with reality understand how a market works and then trade accordingly so if you think oh i'm going to use a tight stop i can't use a loose loose stop then you're going to guarantee yourself a loss. I did an article a while back, The Myth of Tight Stops. It's floating around the Internet somewhere. I think I might even have it on my website if you poke around education. And I went through a lot more length than this to show that that stop within a normal volatility is going to be a lot more likely to get hit. And just like I showed you earlier, okay, let's say you're using this tight stop where you're only risking one and trying to get three. Again, this is going to be three times more likely to get hit than this so you're going to lose three times as much as you win well, Dave, what about over here you're going to win three times as much as you lose yeah but when you lose it's going to be a big ouch so you've got to come out come up with a way to have a money management system that's going to going to pay you at least a little bit if you're wrong by taking that taking I mean a little bit if you're right taking the partial profits control the losses if you're wrong and then have an aspect to it of unlimited losses and that's why I believe in the short term trading take that little piece off get that stop up to break even and then ride out that trend for hopefully what turns out to a long long trend now if you look at the portfolio, you see we have a long here called um, XNet, okay? And this one hit the profit target yesterday, okay? Now, this is, again, a 2% risk, and then we're taking off half of it when we get 1%. That's only 1000 bucks. Yeah, it's better than poking the eye, okay? So that's 1% on a $100,000 hypothetical account. Let's keep it all hypothetical just so we don't get in trouble with anyone, okay? It's all educational purposes only, right? Okay. So you make a thousand dollars better than poke the eye on the first loaf, and then hopefully you make some multiple thereof. Well, so far, eh, not too impressive. Okay. But you can see this one here. We made a little bit more than a thousand dollars in the first loaf because it gapped through our stop. I'm sorry. I want to say stop. I mean, uh, in this case, I mean a profit target. Gap through our profit target. So we made 1.3%. Eh, it's not setting the world on fire, but it's better than poking the eye. And then so far, so good, a couple thousand dollars and change on the second loaf. But again, I'd rather see this number be 10 times bigger. And I could care less how many winning trades we have in here, as long as we've got a few big winners carrying the portfolio. Okay. It's kind of fairly even distributed here. Um, because we don't have any huge winners just yet. We don't have that $8,000 or $20,000 winner, okay? But I, again, I'd much rather this number be much larger and this these be less accurate, okay? I mean, if I had my rathers, you used to be a little country girl. If I had my rathers, I guess she had her rathers because she left me. She'd rather be with somebody else. But that's a good thing for me <laughs> in the long run. It didn't seem like it at the time. But I digress. So if I had my rathers, yeah, they'd be 100% correct, and I'd make um, a ton and ton of money down here, okay? But as a general statement, I'm more worried about making money than being correct. Now, getting back to the stop thing, this is the X that I just showed you, and this 27% gain 
that works out to a 1% gain in the overall portfolio. Now, there's a popular method out there, and what's ironic is somebody just emailed me. Phil, are you in here? Phil from my buddy Phil from England and said, hey, Dave, one of your stocks just got picked up by this popular system. <laughs> I'm like, oh, well, that's interesting. And anyway, this popular system says, and I haven't checked on it lately, but last time I checked, it says you should risk 8% per trade. Now, a couple years ago, as I've said before, I was speaking at GGU to the TSAASF, San, uh, Technical Analysis Society of San Francisco, at uh, GGU, Golden Gate University, which is one of the few universities that has a technical analysis curriculum. It's not an official degree, but it's a it's a paper, it's a what do you call it? Certificate you can get by going to school there. Anyway, before I digress too far, I was showing a, a stock, one of my famous Dave Landry stocks, with about a 20% stop. And some guy begins to argue with me. And, and to those of you who've heard the story before, and I apologize, we've got some new people here today. And I explained that saying that we all should use an 8% stop on every stock, regardless of its volatility. It's like kind of saying like, we should all wear a medium-sized shirt. I haven't. My fat ass hasn't worn medium-sized shirt since I was 10 years old. Probably that's an exaggeration. Probably since I was five years old. Okay. The point is that your stop has to be outside that normal volatility. Now, as I said earlier, I showed you a little chart earlier. If you go back to the um, chart I had earlier, I took the scaling on on purpose. Okay. So if the scaling wasn't in here, this would look like a pretty Good looking trade, little trend knockout and everything, okay? But some people can't risk. Well, I can't risk 27% of the trade. Well, it moves 18% in one day, okay? So, so what? How much percent you're risking? And I'm going to show you once you see this at a spreadsheet, you're going to be like, wow, that's that does make a lot of sense. If the pattern's there, the pattern's there, okay? And notice that right after we got into this trade, the market decided that it wasn't going to move exactly in our favor, and we were faced with a 14% loss. So let's say you're following the little system, 8%, okay, 8%. So you would get in right here, and then probably by the end of the day, you'd be stopped out, okay? And if not by the end of the day, within the next day, you'd be stopped out. Now, even once things begin to move in our favor, you see we had some drawdowns along the way. And then right here, just on a close to close basis, you take this close and this close here two days later, it dropped 11%. Well, so what? Which way is it generally headed? It's headed up, okay? So what do you do? You freak out? No, you stick with the trade. Now, every now and then, you do get some pretty good timing. Right, okay. This particular case, we only had a 1.5% drawdown from the entry to the low. That's an exception. That's not the norm. Even in some of your greatest trades, they're still going to go against you a little bit, okay? And you have to live through that. So you can't seek out comfort and say, well, I'm going to exit every time it goes 8% against me. And in this particular case, we're looking for a 15% profit target. So that means that our risk was about 15%. I don't remember exactly what the stop is. Probably down here somewhere. Let's see, 35 minus, yeah, about five points. Okay. And that's what it called for based on the volatility of the stock. But you can see right here, it's even, even from the high to the low over these two days, it still moved almost 7%. So, I mean, that's dangerously close to getting stopped out. Stopped out. So, if you did have an 8% stop, I mean, especially like in a case like this, you know, your stops would be like here. And it's like, it's that noise alone is going to hit that. That I can guarantee. Now, here's one we're long. Nice little setup back here. Nice little accelerating higher, a little pullback, accelerating higher trend in an IPO. It's got everything working for it. And we get into here, we took some partial profits here. That's in the portfolio. That was the NVRO we're looking at. That was at $1,300 and change. Okay, on the first loaf. And then so far, 
we're trailing a stop higher. And so far, we haven't gotten stopped out. Now it's getting a little squirrely in here. And it's trying to shake us out. And who was it, Coval? Coval says um, it's like uh, riding a bouncing Bronco, hanging on to a trend. That trend's going to try to knock you out. Okay. And as long as your stop is outside the normal volatility, and again, we let this stop widen out, gradually widen out, so we could ride out these adverse moves, hopefully, and be in the trend for a long, long time. So hopefully, a couple years from now, we'll pull this chart up and take a look at it. Okay. Now, here's one from a while back when I did the original presentation, and somebody said they couldn't use this big old wide stop. Well, if you take the scaling out of here, and you just looked at this chart, okay? That's a pretty good looking chart. You've got acceleration higher. It's kind of accelerating momentum strategy, as you can see. You've got some persistency in the bars. You could, uh, the other night when I was doing my presentation, it's just this uh, parabola regression persistency could be a, a trading system in and of itself. Or I just look at the chart and say, is it accelerating higher or is it decelerating higher? You don't want to trade a stock that looks like this unless you're going to short it, right? So that looks pretty good. And again, if you take the scaling out, so what if this is a one-point move or a five-point move or a 10-point move? You're going to adjust your position size accordingly. Well, in this particular case, our entry was 44. So let's take a look at that in a spreadsheet. So the question is, are wider stops bigger risk? Well, if we're risking 2% per trade or $2,000, if stopped out, if this $44 stock was not very volatile and we were using a one point stop, well, do the math on this. 2000 divided by one is what? Uh, let me see. Carry the one, two, zero. Oh, that's 2000. Okay, that's pretty easy. Okay. Multiply that times the share price of $44. And this will require you to put up $88,000 on a $100,000 account. So if the world blows up, I guess we'd have bigger problems if the world blows up. Let's just say the stock blows up. You could lose 88% of your account. Well, let's just say it gets a 50% haircut overnight. It goes from 44 to 22, okay? Something bad happens. Well, you would still lose 44% of your account. So you're nearly blown up. 50% is a good benchmark for blowing up an account, okay? Because statistically and psychologically, it's going to be really hard to come back from that, okay? Most hedge funds, once they, once they, once they hit 50, 51%, all the investors leave anyway. So for all intents and purposes, they have to close up shop, okay? So as you can see, the wider your stop gets – and we were using an eight-point stop in this particular case. The fewer shares you trade, so your absolute total risk at stake is 11% or $11,000 of the account. 11%, $11,000. All right. Well, let's say we get a 50% haircut overnight. Well, you're going to lose $5,500, okay, $5,500 or 5%, 5 percent, five and a half percent of your account overnight. Well, that's a lot better than losing 44% of your account when this gets a 50% haircut overnight. This will blow you up on just one position, okay? This is going to suck, but you can withstand quite a few bumps in a road like this. Now, the reason you want to be in these more volatile stocks, like I kind of was trying to use the example earlier, is you want to fish where the tide is moving. You want to fish at a stock that's moving. If that, if that stock is moving and it's volatile enough to trade, then the chances are that it's volatile enough to make a move in your favor, provided you get your timing right and your stock selection is great. Okay. So that's why you want to be in that more volatile stock. So it's got a pretty good chance of moving at eight points. And you're getting that profit target out. Now, remember, and I'm probably going to say it here a few times today, but remember something bad could always happen. 
in a lower volatility stock. Just for fun, right before the show, I was looking at, at uh, these lower HV stocks, like HV of 12, 13, 14, whatever. Add or around what the market is, the overall market. And if you get a chance, uh, sort all your tradable universe by HV and look at the low HV ones first. Just the opposite of what I do every day. I look at the high HV ones first. And you're going to see that there's still some big old gaps in some 40 and 50% moves, some haircuts in those, in those lower volatility stocks. And you're going to have a much bigger position on as relative to the size of your account if you're trading those stocks because in general they don't move around a lot so you're going to have to risk a lot more to capture a move in those stocks also a stock that isn't very volatile is going to take a long time to make a move okay so you're going to be in the market for a long long time now i want to be in any market for 10 years when i get into the stock i want to be in any stock i get in for at least 10 years because that means that I've probably made a lot of money because it's moved in my favor for the last 10 years, okay? The reality is it gets stopped out much sooner. So I'm not saying you don't want to be in the market for a long time. But what I am saying is a lower volatile, volatile stock compared to high volatile stock is going to take a longer, much, 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 much longer time to materialize for a move to materialize all predictions are about the future a lot of stuff can happen between now and then if you're in a more volatile stock and you've got a couple hundred percent gain already in the stock and you're trailing that stop higher then so what if something bad happens in the future you've made so much money in a more volatile stock by riding out that trend than you would have in a lower volatile stock okay so kind of be the dead horse on this but it's like uh Tony Robbins once said, it's kind of like the preacher who said the same thing over and over again every week. And then one of the parishioners goes up and says, uh, preacher, I don't know how to say this, but I can't help but notice that you're saying the same thing over and over. And, and the preacher says, well, I'm glad you noticed, and I'm going to keep saying the same thing over and over until you people get it. But I guarantee you tomorrow, I'm going to get an email. Hey, Dave, your stocks are too wide. I can't do that. Dave, your stocks are too volatile. Well, you have to adjust accordingly, and the market doesn't care about your comfort zone. The market doesn't care what you want and what makes you comfortable. You have to do what needs to be done. But adjust your account size accordingly. Adjust your, I'm sorry, adjust your risk size down in your account accordingly. Trade fewer shares in a more volatile stock. You're much, much better off trading fewer shares in a more volatile stock than trading more shares in a less volatile stock. So, again, in spite of a popular method that uses a fixed stop, there is no one size fits all. That's one of the few things I can guarantee you. Too tight of a stop will almost always guarantee you a loss. Looser stops within reason will help you, help you catch more and more trends. And that's why once we're in a position, once we get that swing trade move out, we begin to loosen that stop slowly, okay, often by not doing anything. It stops at 50, goes to 51. We leave the stop where it is. So just by not doing anything, that stop slowly widens out. Okay. And that's how we position from the trader to the longer term trend follower. Go back and watch the presentation I did two nights ago. Go to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash C is in Charlie for custom, C for Charlie or C for custom slash Dave Landry and look back two nights ago or two days ago and you'll see the have you cake eat it too, where I talked about making that transition from the trader to the trend follower. You have to be a trader because only a short term can be predicted when it comes to the markets. You have to be a longer term trend follower because that's where the real money is. But if you could do both and bring it all together, you're going to do incredibly well because you'd be able to get that short term gain out, make your little ego feel good, okay? And your risks are fairly in line or fairly small, relatively small. And you capture that longer term gain. So you, you get your, your longer term ego gets paid off. You get more money. You get the most amount of money in a longer term trend. Okay. And your risk, at least from a starting standpoint, actually decreases because it becomes 
you're dealing with open profits, and I'll talk a little bit about that in one second. So again, stops must be adjusted to the volatility of the stock. And better, better the devil you know. I'd much rather trade a more volatile stock, knowing that it's going to be volatile, than trade a stock that's not very volatile. And then the CEO decides he wants to shag the secretary. The secretary is not too keen on that idea. And then the stock loses, I don't know what it was, 10 day in the overnight or whatever. Okay. <laughs> you know, dumb things happen even in less volatile stocks. But a more volatile stock, it's it's sort of within reason and it's sort of expected. And you've already adjusted for that, embraced for it, okay? So there's no safe haven. Again, you know, something bad can still happen in a volatile stock, such as uh, impropriety by a CEO. Now, timing is everything. And this is a chart I've kind of beat the dead horse on, but it's just such a wonderful trade and this is that that cldx that i keep coming back to but notice that we were up 12 percent then zero percent 25 percent then four percent 44 percent then 25 percent 95 72 211 percent and then stopped out at 153 so even though this is a beautiful trade if you if every trade turned out this great you'd own the world in about a year okay But even this fantastic trade, you still had to give up a lot of money along the way. It's like Covell says, again, riding that bouncing, bouncing Bronco. Now, when I showed this example, or one like it, to um, my colleagues over at the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts uh, Conference, one of the guys said, well, I, 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 what am I going to tell my clients? When I gave up those profits, well, I'm just kind of thinking out loud here. It's like, well, you never would have had those profits anyway if you wouldn't have been willing to give up some of the gains along the way. So that's a good way of putting it, too. So what are you going to tell them? Well, if you cash out, you need to tell them that you could have made a lot more money for them had you not cashed out. And then tell them if you want comfort, buy a comforter. OK, you're going to have to give up some of those open profits along the way. Stock selection, again, is always key. I can't emphasize this point enough. So we're not just buying a stock because it's volatile. We're buying a stock because it has structure. So you have to ask yourself, what's the setup? Is there a bigger picture pattern in place? Okay. Some sort of big picture technical analysis pattern. Again, we don't trade off of that. We trade off a setup. But if a setup is backed by a bigger picture pattern, then we go for it. Does it trade cleanly? Meaning, does it, does it tend to go up day after day after day? Or in other words, does it persist when it does trend? Um, and by trading cleanly, does it tend to trend, pull back, thrust, pull back, thrust, pull back, rinse and repeat? Okay. Make that sawtooth pattern higher. Or does it look like an electric cardiogram? The other question, too, is, is it accelerating? All the time, people are like, hey, Dave, I like the stock. Okay? And the stock looks something like this. Dave looks great. Look, it's up 100%, and it's pulled back. Well, wait a minute, though. It's also, it's also rolling over. Okay? It also hasn't gone anywhere in three or four months. So always ask yourself, What's the net net change? Where was it a week ago, a month ago, two months ago, and so on and so forth? I got this question yesterday or this morning. I forget. I, I don't know if I answered them yet or not. But if you're trading Dave Landry style, what are you going to do? You could draw a big blue arrow in your charts. So he wanted to buy this stock today. I'm thinking, why? It's at 18. Where was it a week ago? 18. Where was it, oh, I don't know, a month ago, 18? Where was it way back in March, 18? So if you didn't know anything, you could look at the chart, you know, maybe use a newspaper for this type of analysis. Get the newspaper from March, open it up, see where the stock is trading. Get the newspaper for June 17th, yesterday's newspaper, and see where it's trading, okay? So it was uh, 18 and change then. 
and a little bit less than 18 in. So it's actually it's actually going down in three months. Where's the trend? Where's the momentum? Now, let's say you did trade, get in somewhere where when the stock did have momentum and it starts going sideways. Well, that's no problem. Sometimes stocks take a little time to consolidate their gains. Maybe the stock is going to move higher. But from a timing perspective, you don't want to buy a stock that's going sideways with the hope that it'll start going up. Buy a stock that's already gone up. Okay. Trade with the trend. Trade with the momentum. All right, any questions on all? I know people are not too excited about money management and stops and all this other stuff, but it's all a necessary evil. You have to understand all these things if you're going to be successful. Don't seek out comfort, okay, for the sake of seeking out comfort. Do the right thing. Make sure your stop is outside of the normal volatility of a market, okay? Make sure you've got your risk in line. Make sure you're not, as the old commodity adage says, eating like a bird and defecating like an elephant. That means taking little bitty gains and taking big old losses. So make sure you have that risk to reward in line and understand fully what you're doing. It's not my way or the highway. There's more than one way to skin a cat. I know that. But I think what I'm doing makes a lot of sense. And as I often preach, if you could take a piece of what I'm doing and make your stuff better, then by all means, please do it. Thank you, Michael. Michael says, very good stuff, all in caps. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. All right, we're getting ready to jump out in charts. And here, you guys want to start asking, uh, I know uh, uh, Daphne has a question about an individual stock. I mean, I'm sorry about a, a concept here we're going to get to in just one second. Uh, if you want to start asking about individual stocks, please do so now. Just uh, put the symbol in and then hit return. Uh, just one or two announcements, and then I'm going to jump into the, um, we'll dump, jump to the actual charts. We'll take a look at the market real quick, and then we'll uh, we'll take a look at all your stock questions um, after we cover this one question on trading first. Uh, I'm still running the seven dollar special, and I'm gonna. It's kind of an experiment to see how well it goes, um, but you can get into service for seven bucks for one month. That's gonna give you complete access to all the more recent services for the last year or so. You're gonna get the daily video, and you could you could certainly email me if you have any questions on on the stock picks what I was thinking, mentality, anything like that, okay? So you'll get the same exact stuff that everyone else is getting uh, for that teaser rate. Uh, it's a one-time deal. So check it out. And just go to uh, DaveLander.com trading service or go to products of my home trading and uh, check that out. All right, let's uh, hop into the charts. Okay, um, real quick, let's cover this question. I got a question about um, first thrust. And uh, inline RT, let's see, what this, let's see what it looks like. Okay. And the question is, um, should I trade the REITs because they're having this big thrust higher? And I don't trust them. And I think you're right to say I don't trust them. First of all, not that you want to mix, confuse the issue with facts too much, but you do have to kind of put all the pieces together. And you can see that bonds are certainly headed lower, and bonds are certainly headed, or have been headed lower for a while. And you can see that, obviously, you've got a first thrust in bonds way back here. You can see it did have a little retrace back up, but as a general statement, They've been headed lower for quite a while, so rates are headed up, and that's going to put pressure on the REITs. Now, of course, you don't want to just trade REITs off bonds. Now, unfortunately, it's difficult. You can't just trade one market off the other, but there is some correlation there, and you do have to pay attention to it. And you can see that if we look at the overall sector, it broke down to new lows, and then it's popping back up in here, especially today. Well, if I'm going to trade a transition in the market, I want to trade that transition off of major, major lows. I want to be buying real estate in 2009, okay? Hey, Dave, that's hindsight. Well, we were buying a lot of stocks in 2009, a boatload of stocks set up, okay? I want to be shorting them 
and obviously when they when did they top out 2005 or whatever if you're trading a transition an emerging trend you want an emerging trend to come off of a major high or a major low so right now in the REITs if you zoom in the chart you're coming off a multi-year high so that's that's somewhat important okay if you were to short them yeah you probably want to be shorting them in here and not buying them because this isn't a major low this is only a multi-month low in here and they might just be bouncing in this little choppy downturn that they're in. So as a general statement, you want to avoid the REITs. So let's go back to uh, his example. Okay, first of all, this stock's a little choppy in here, okay? You can see that it did run up, but it came right back in. It's up, it's down, and then it's just chops, 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 then fell out of bed. Then today it just goes straight up. So this is not a stock that I would be very excited to rush out and buy just because it's really choppy, okay? And also, it's got a lot of problems with it. So the REITs overall are not looking so hot because, yes, they're bouncing from their lows, but they still look like they could be in trouble in here. So I would pass based on that. Remember, a setup doesn't exist in a vacuum unless it's the, unless it's the mother of all setups. Then you take it. When you see a chance, you take it. The Steve Winwood trade, okay? So... If you have the mother of all setups, then by all means, take it. Anything less, you want to question it, okay? And do that obsess before you get into the trade, not afterward that I'm always talking about. So I would pass on this. I also would not take any first thrust setups in the REITs unless it was the mother of all setups. So to answer your question, uh, he, uh, his question was, do you trust this move? And my answer is no in the REITs. I think the REITs are just having a bit of a bounce in here. I would say a dead cat bounce when somebody will get mad at me. Why can you beat a dead horse, but you can't talk about a dead cat? I don't understand that. That's an old Wall Street thing. I'm not suggesting you go out and bounce a dead cat. But the cat's dead anyway, so what difference does it make? It, you know, I don't, I'm, I don't get it. All right, let's take a look at the market. I guess I just lost a, a cat lover client. <laughs> All right, um... I've been saying this at nauseam. Every time this market sells off, it comes right back. That's a good thing, right? Unfortunately, every time it comes right back, it sells off. So we've had, in other words, a choppy market in here. Now, if we close a little bit higher, I think, let me see if there's another day in here that's a little higher. Yeah. We're within a half a percent of all time highs in the S&P 500. So that's a good thing. But obviously, it's pretty choppy in here. Okay. Never forget your net net change. You go back to last December or even last November, and you can see we haven't made a whole lot of forward progress. But the good thing is, as a general statement, the market has been headed higher for a long, long time. And I talk about this quite often. Go in and watch the webinar from two nights ago again and you can see that this market is at daylight meaning the lows above the moving average I still left my little trend line here as you can see okay for a long 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 time now just keep in mind that everything works better with trend you don't want to rush out and trade daylight but ask yourself what is the daylight is there daylight and am I trading on the side of the daylight okay So we're not too far from all-time highs. That's a good thing. The caveat is you still have to get there, okay? So let's not get too excited, start kissing each other just yet until this market can break out to new highs and stay there. If you're long, stay long by all means. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. If the NASDAQ can close where it is now, we're at all-time highs. Now, here's where you got to be really careful because – over the past few months, every time this market has a little bit of a sell-off, the chicken littles come out of the woodwork. Oh, it's the end of the world, okay? We've had a fantastic portfolio so far this year, knock on wood, in spite of the market going sideways, okay? If I would have exited the portfolio and not taken any new positions, as soon as the market started going sideways, late last year, I wouldn't have put on all these wonderful positions, okay? So you can't just rush out and dump everything as soon as the market looks a little iffy. But what you can do is you can be very selective on any new positions. 
and ask yourself, do I really, really like this setup? Could I live with not taking this setup? Okay, the can't stand it test. And that's a very important thing to ask yourself. Again, obsess before you get a trade into a trade, not afterwards. Don't try to outsmart the market. The being right versus making money thing, okay? We made money by not trying to outsmart the market. I probably should stop calling myself a trend following moron, but that's what I do, okay? And I get emails from people quite often, day after day, same person, day after day, okay, or every three or four days. Yep, this is the top. This is the top. Ever since, you know, 2011. So four years, every other day, it's the top. Well, not that smart. They're going to be right sooner or later, you know, predict early and often. But you got to be really careful in doing all that. And whenever you find yourself plotting that 15th oscillator or trying to figure out if it's a fifth of a third or a third of a fifth or a baby with a poopy diaper or a wrestler beating up on a, I don't know, three birds crapping on a wire or whatever the case may be. Um, or as a cartoon Phil sent me a couple days ago, what is it? A, a, a rack, if it's a squirrel sitting on a clown's shoulder, you know, <laughs> ask yourself, is the market generally going up, generally going down, or is it just plain going sideways? And the answer to that is longer term, this market's going up. Today it's going up, okay? Short to intermediate term, it's going sideways. So you don't want to rush out and blindly buy a bunch of stocks. But if you see a long setup that looks pretty good, then you take it, okay? And conversely, if you see a short that looks fantastic, eh, take it, okay? But you want to err on the side of the longer-term trend, especially if the market is at or near new highs. Don't be a hero and try to call a top as long as the market is within a few percent of its new highs. And I don't want to get into this too, too much because I don't want to give you too much of a false sense of security. But it is pretty much a fact that although it feels like markets just crash, and sometimes they do, don't get me wrong, but most of the time it's going to be a little bit more of a process than an event. And the chances are better than average if you do have a stop in place, a properly placed stop in place, like we just talked about, then you're going to get stopped out long before that market does crash, okay? And if you go back in three or four weeks ago, I talked about that the market was looking a little iffy, and but it was just coming off of brand new highs. So believe it or not, it bottoms are actually more spiky than tops. I know it's hard to believe, and that's the beauty of, of uh, I'm not bragging, but just because I've, I'm, I have, I get to rub elbows with some of these guys in the industry that have been around a lot longer than I have, okay? And they point out these things, and it just kind of wakes me up that these these tops are actually more of a process than an event. And that's a pretty cool thing. The bottoms often are an event. You get a panic sell-off, and then all of a sudden, psh, you get this vacuum, and the market comes right back. So just remember that, and don't rush out and call this market. You know, it's not dead yet. It's a Monty Python market. It's not dead yet. Okay, It might be dead by next Tuesday, like the character in Monty Python. But it's not dead yet. Take a look at the monthly chart. You can see NASDAQ's had a pretty good run in here. How long can this be sustainable? I have no idea. Again, it could stop by, it could be dead by next Tuesday. Okay. But it might not be. And how do you know? Well, you don't. But you just follow along and trail your stop higher. If you get stopped out, you get stopped out. Okay. Now, a lot of the sectors in here, as you would imagine, let's take a look at the Rusty first. And then we're almost ready to jump into stocks, so keep uh, keep asking the questions on stocks. I'm I'm gonna get there. Rusty looks fantastic. Now, what have I been preaching here and here and here and, and all year, right? Okay, Rusty's going sideways, and I've been preaching. Okay, let's not count it out just yet because you're not that far from new highs. Yes, you still have to get there. Okay. Well, today we finally got there. Okay, day ain't over yet, but so far so good. Break it out nicely to new highs. Air on the side of the longer term trend. Keep it simple. Don't try to outsmart the market. Okay. Problem is your ego is going to rear its ugly, ugly head. Oh, it's a top. Oh, it's going too far. How much further can it go? And you'll start all this mental mess and get yourself in a lot of trouble. 
A lot of sectors, like the market itself, have been really sideways as of late. The good news is they're starting to bounce off the bottoming range and come up. Ideally, though, you want to see them hit some new highs. That's the semis. Take a look at retail. You can go through quite a few of these. And they've all recently touched the bottom of their range, tested them. And now retail so far tried to bounce back off that range and head back to its old highs. But again, take things one day at a time. Energies uh, have bottomed out. We caught a nice little trend here, but then they came right back in. So I wouldn't rush out and buy any energies at this juncture. Metals and mining have gone down, tested their old lows. There's no need to be a hero. Again, there's your big picture pattern. But when are we going to trade this? We're going to trade this when it starts going up again. We're not going to try to catch that falling knife and be a hero and look smart because we bought the battles down towards the lows. No, we're much better off letting them bottom out, let them rally, and see where they go. Okay, ditto for gold, kind of down here. Kind of has like a quadruple bottom, okay? Which is fine, but wait for this to rally off its lows. Wait for it to set up before looking to take any action. These are gold stocks, by the way, not gold or commodity. We'll take a look at gold real quick if you guys want. Uh, gold commodity looks a lot to, like the gold stocks, but kind of wide and loose in here. So I don't see any reason to rush out and buy any gold just yet. Wait for it to go up. Let's take a look at just one or two more areas, and then we'll uh, we'll hop out to the charts. Take a look at the regional banks. And a couple of days ago, they broke out the new highs, and then they had a little bit of a reversal bar yesterday. But so far, so good. They're still headed higher. Okay, and this is in spite. Of rates going down, maybe rates rates going up. I should say bonds going down. Maybe that helps them out a little bit. Take a look at drugs. Uh, having a pretty good day here. Kind of uh, sideways at best lately, but a few big days here, a few big up days will make all the difference in the world. Biotech is breaking out today. That looks pretty good. Okay, so so far so good there. Now we don't necessarily buy the breakout, and except for in certain cases and such as like an ipo we do have some breakout strategies that we apply there but for the most part though we do not buy breakouts so that's looking pretty good transports still look a little iffy in here and i'm not a big fan of like dow theory or anything that requires the transports to confirm the overall market action because look what's happening today. The market's making new highs, but the transports aren't following along. Now, somebody smarter than me is going to probably put on an article today and say, don't trust these new highs because the transports aren't following along. Well, they might be right, but is the market going up? Yes. So I should be long. Don't try to figure it all out. That doesn't mean you should ignore what's going on in the transports. You have to look at everything. Okay, well, transport's going down. That scores as a negative, but it doesn't necessarily mean that stocks are going to go down. I've been doing a little reading on uh, trading psychology lately, and um, who was it? Uh, Gilovich? G-I-L-O-V-I-C-H. He was talking about the um, regressive variable. When you have two things that are related, but imperfectly, you end up with this regression error. And we as humans try to make that perfect correlation. Oh, transport's down, that means stocks will go down. Not necessarily, but it could put pressure on stocks, but it's not a direct relationship. And it's not always a direct relationship, but it's certainly not um, one for one. Or you, you can't really time a market based on that. So, yeah, recognize that transports are going down. Recognize that those two things could be related but they're related imperfectly okay and that's technical analysis or intermarket technical analysis in general you have a lot of imperfect relationships like the dollar going down is going to make gold go up and the dollar has been going down but gold really hasn't been going up a lot okay so they're related but related imperfectly and that leads to regression errors where we as humans try to make that direct correlation and sometimes there simply is not. So that's a, a good little takeaway on that. Uh, healthcare plans have been uh, breaking out to brand new highs, so that's looking pretty good. So as you go through the sectors, you can have a few that look like this, and you can have more than a few that look like this. But with today's action, especially a little follow-through, um, they're going to start looking better and better and better. Okay? All right, let's hop out. Let me um, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at some uh, some charts here. Dave, could you show a CL chart? Now, I'm not going to like uh, – this is uh, Isidore. Isidore, I'm not going to like CL, and I'll tell you why I'm not going to like it. 
it's a big, thick, 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 thick stock. Okay, your 50-day average volume is was about 29 million shares. I can't see it. I need to put some glasses on. But I think it's about 30 million. Trades about 30 million shares a day. That's a lot of trading. And look at the HV. The HV is 12. This is historical volatility or statistical volatility. Let's take a look at spiders real quick. Spiders are 10. So it's pretty much right in line with the overall market. I'm going to go out on a limb here and make a statement. I'm going to make a statement. It's fact. You're not going to beat a market by trading stocks that are the same volatility or in lower volatility in the market. How do you beat a market? Well, you trade something like NVRO. Okay. That has a potential to go up 50%. 50% over a short period of time, okay? Since December to June, it went up 50%. Well, what did the market do from December to June? Okay, this is an HV of 56. And what did the market do December to June? The market went up 3%. Depends on how you count that, okay, or where you start. But you can go way back to December, and you can say, well, the market's up 1%. And if today's rally wasn't in there, it'd be up none percent, right? So that's how you beat the market. So getting back to the CL, now I don't know if you want to buy it or sell it, but where was it a few months ago and where is it now? It looks like to me it's headed lower. It's bouncing a little bit, but heading lower. And you back the chart way out, and you can see it's just kind of going sideways at best. So I would avoid this stock and find something that's trending nicely and find something that's a little bit more volatile and trades cleanly. So this is not that volatile stock, but it just kind of chops around. It kind of looks like electric cardiogram. Okay. James wants to know about TRCH. TRCH. This is one that caught my eye a while back. A little cheap stock, a little cheap in here, but I did like this little cup and handle that it made. Volume's a little low for such a low-priced stock. Um, I would pass on it just because it's it's actually, I just told you all these things about volatility, but this is actually too volatile, okay? It's a little too crazy, and it's still kind of a penny stock, and you can see that it made these big moves in here. It looked okay back here, um, but I would pass on that now. CBPO, CBPO for Don. Not that Don, the other Don. Well, this one had a really serious knockout, okay? And I wouldn't have gone after this stock. This might have been on our radar a while back. But I wouldn't have gone after it because this move was just a little too extreme because it broke out of its base. And then it came all the way back in, okay? And then, yeah, it did have a pretty good rally in here. And, again, you can't kiss all the women, right? But now it's sort of stalling out at its prior highs in here. So if you're long, stay long, have a stop in place. But uh, as a new setup in and of itself, no, avoid that. Art wants to know about PN. PN. Yeah, it looks fantastic. Um, the only problem here it's jumping out at me is it's super, super thin, okay? So be really, really careful. It's uh, very, very thin. It could be dangerous to trade, but it is a fairly new issue. And sometimes with new issue, volume comes into markets, into the markets. But this is kind of your first pullback after it has begun to trend. So I would say I'd give you a high five if it had a little bit more volume, but very, very thin, very, very dangerous because of that volume. But absolutely, it looks fantastic. Okay. So nice job on that, Art. Right. PRGO, that's another one I'm not going to like much, okay? See, these are these are stocks. Well, this one's actually pretty volatile. Uh, the problem with this one is it made this one huge wide-range bar higher, and then it just began to chop around. And also, you could draw your line. Where is it now? Where was it uh, two months ago, okay? So I would avoid this stock. There's no structure there. There's nothing that can be traded. You had that one big day, but that just be that's just a bit of an aberration. Okay. All right. Howard wants to know about Trove. Uh, on a pullback, maybe. Okay. It's not bad. Um, 
looks like you're you're accelerating okay uh ideally in this particular case i like to see it kind of break out a little bit further from the base that it's in this little base here before pulling back but yeah by all means put that on your watch list it's just not set up just yet steve wants to know about expa don's here and what does he want to know about ford um well it pulled back too many days for my taste for an established issue. Now, IPO is a little bit different, but for an established issue like Expedia, we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen days in the pullback. And if you were just looking to get into it, now you got 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, you know, it's about a month worth of pulling back in here. Um, if you're long, stay long by all means, but. I think I would pass. It also tends to trade in chunks, which could be, you know, it looks probably earnings or something. Gaps down, gaps up, gaps up, sells off, comes back, gaps down. So I think I would leave this one alone and find some find something new, Steve, that's uh, beginning to develop as a trend like that. Um, what's the one that Howard was looking at? The Trove. Uh Something that's in, well, that's in a pretty fairly established trend, but something that's in somewhat of a newer trend as opposed to a long, 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 long established one. Greg wants to know about RX, DX. Uh, the problem with this is you've got this one big bar here, and that's the majority of your trend, okay? It kind of made that quantum leap higher. So things get a little squirrely. Yeah, it jumped like 80%. So it jumped like 80% in one day. And notice that your HV is now 124. Not that it won't trade crazy stocks, okay? But when your HV gets, it's a, it's a triple digits. That's a 50-day HV. I'll give you the formula. It's in the back of my first book. I'll give it to you. It's also, I give you the, um, I give you the code for trade state, not trade station. Um, I used to have trade station code because I wrote that too. But um, I can give you the code for telechart. I give it uh, Metastock too, but you can just get Metastock off the internet. Um, and it's a much shorter line of code. So make sure you got, you're got you studying HV on your charts, okay? Not that it has any predictive quality, but it does tell you what the stock has done. So a 70%, 80% move over a day or two, it's just too crazy. I would leave that one alone. Phil wants to know about PAS. That's going to be a silver stock. Well, it's waking up, okay? And, you know, now might be the time to go after some of these silver stocks and gold stocks soon, not right away. You got a little bit of resistance here, but not a whole lot to worry about. So I would let it follow through a little bit, maybe clear this prior little peak in here before I begin to get too excited about it. Now, keep in mind that these efficient markets like silver and gold and the representative stocks are going to tend to chop around a little bit more than than some of these other stocks that we like to trade, like these IPOs and biotechs and everything else. So there, I'm going to be a little bit more lenient when it comes to patterns in these markets and energies and things like that, as opposed to some of these other stocks that I'm kind of picking apart here. All right, Dan wants to know about Facebook. No. This is a Nicholas. Let's get, let's, are we going to have to whip out Nicholas? And that's not code, by the way. Let's see if we can find Nicholas Fine. Where's Nicholas? Oh, here he is. No. Nicholas Fine is a Saturday Night Live character. <laughs> and um, he does a observational humor or something where he reads a headline and he opines on it. And usually he just says, no. So in this particular case, I'm going to say, no. Because we could draw an arrow. And what has it done? Now, it might break out tomorrow or the next day, but until it does, it's nothing to do, okay? So, and I know some of you guys are new to the methodology, and that's fine. Um, I'm glad you're here. I'm, I'm very glad you're here. But just a couple takeaways today. Just don't forget about the net-net change of a market. In fact, let's just do a net-net change going back to March, okay? So it's three months. It's three months, and the stock is down 3%. 
I'd much rather be in that biotech that's up 40% in three months and pull back, okay, than a stock that's going pretty much nowhere for the last uh, six to eight months and actually down in three months, okay? Yeah, longer term, it might be a longer term trend, just consolidating. If you're long, stay long, you know, have a stop at place around 70, I guess. And then maybe it'll be 140 next year and you could have a stop at 120 or something. That'd be great. But there's no need to rush out and buy this stock today. Phil wants to know about Tahoe. Tahoe. Well, usually with the mining stocks, I can be a little lenient when you have a slight gap against the trend. But this is a pretty big gap in here. So I would wait for this gap to fill, let it break out. I think we're too early in the metals. We just looked at them a second ago. We've got a triple bottom in place. And gold, I think you have a quadruple bottom. Um, start watching them. But watch is a key word in that sentence. And a lot of times these markets can be more of a process than an event when it comes to a bottom, especially these commodity-related areas. Heather wants to know about shop. IPO is the first pullback. Um, yeah, but it hasn't pulled back enough just yet, but absolutely. Okay, it's starting to pull back. Maybe a little bit more pullback, but uh, yeah, have that on your radar. That looks good. Uh, you did have your breakout. Remember earlier I said breakouts? First breakouts can be a pretty good pattern. I think last week I didn't um, – I said that um, I wasn't a big fan of trading a first breakout in this uh, particular case because it's a little bit higher price stock. It's a shop in like a, a retail stock or something. But yeah, it looks pretty good now that you've got the breakout. So now it's now that it's a secondary signal. In fact, I think it's probably pulled back enough because it is an IPO and you're not going to get that perfection that you're going to get in other uh, stocks. So who said that, Heather? Heather, we're going to get we're going to give you a high five on this one, okay? We need like a high five noise. I think Heather's on the service. I tend to. Hey, Dave, I see you seem to really. You're really nice to those people in the service. Oh, really? Huh? I never noticed that. No, because I'll beat you up if you if you say something wrong. Because I'd rather you learn than be flattered. Uh, who recommended this? All right, Steve, we've got to beat you up on this. TH. Make sure I got the right stock. THNX? THNX? No. Um, no, I mean, you know, it was came public around seven and now it's around five. Uh, no, it's all over the place. So, no. Somebody told me recently when they're looking through the uh, charts and, um, <laughs> and they see charts that look like this now that they've been around for a while. They could actually hear Nicholas in the head. No. Phil says we took our abuse early on and more circumspect now and are more circumspect now. Good. Yeah. I mean, it's a, that's a beautiful thing. When, when, when I, that's kind of like the, I don't know. I woke up this morning feeling kind of warm and fuzzy. And it was th I was just thinking about how great it is when I could when I could take somebody along, take somebody who's looking at charts like this, just starting out, and then they begin to all of a sudden send me charts that look like the the shop and and the and the nice persistent stocks and the stocks that are accelerating trends and all these other things that I preach. It um, makes me feel good. All right, Don wants to be beat up for Ford. Uh, it's you know, it's like the guy that goes bear hunting. You know, the bear taps him on the shoulder. You're not here for the hunting, are you? <laughs> After the bear has his way with him. Well, it's in a nice persistent downtrend. So if you're short, stay short, okay? Um, but the volatility is low, 14, and there's just no structure there. So, you know, don't make me whip out Nicholas. No. Amgen. Let's take a look at Amgen. Uh, no, it's it's too it's too wide and loose and sideways. And this is the big thick biotech stock. I would rather be in a smaller biotech stock. Let's take a look at the portfolio and see what we got in the portfolio. I think uh, is NVRO biotech or it's it's certainly medical related. Okay, I'd rather be in something like this, a little bit smaller stock, a little bit newer, a little bit more excitement than something like biotech that's going sideways. But Dave, it's kind of all over the place. Well. Yeah, but it's generally working its way higher, and we got to stop in place. And then back when we got in, it looked a lot better as far as getting in a stock. Now, 
now that we're in it, we just have to ride out the trend, okay? Uh, blueprint medicines, that's some kind of biotechnology. See, that's what you need to be in, something like that, which is absolutely beautiful. We just talked about this one a few minutes ago. I mean, look at this chart pattern. If this doesn't get you excited, like looking back to this, then you shouldn't be trading, okay? And you got a nice little double top knockout move in here. Not as deep as I would like, but hey, with IPOs, again, we got to be a little bit more lenient. If only there were a course on how to trade IPOs. <laughs> oh, by the way, um, I kind of set it up by accident, but I think I'm going to leave it in place. If you do go with the $7 service special, when you get to that page um, on the website, it, there's a $200 off IPO deal you could uh, take on the IPO course. Uh, courses come with 100% uh, money back guarantee and uh, lifetime um, support. I was trying to multi-process, which has been proven you cannot do, by the way. Scientists have proven that. Uh, Phil says, spinal cord stimulation for back pain sounds like a potential winner. Well, don't confuse the issue with pack, facts, okay? <laughs> so, but yeah, so far so good. Looking pretty, pretty darn good in here. OK, and this is one of those rare cases where you get in and you just you just watch the money accumulate, which is fine. OK, <laughs> fine with me. But in general, positions are going to go against you. How do you use HV to set your stop? I don't use HV directly to set my stop. But when I am looking at a stock, OK, let's take uranium, for instance, uh, UEC. We've got an HV of 80 in here. Well, I know I'm going to have to have a pretty wide stop. But what I also do is I eyeball the stock and say, well, it's going from like 160 up to two something. So that's almost 100% move over a short period of time. So I know it can move quite a long ways. So I better have a pretty wide stop in place. But this HV sort of like confirms what I'm seeing in the charts, okay? F-E-Y-E. Well, I'll be. Don finally gave me a stock that we could actually embrace and like and talk about. God, there's hope for him. There's hope. Look at this. Nice little sideways base. Nothing to do there. But now, nice persistent move higher. So, yes, Don, on a pullback, absolutely. If you're long, stay long. Finally, Don gives me a decent stock. This is actually in my momentum list. This F-E-Y-E. Because it's making new highs. I got my I got the bear on F Y. Oh, you you're bearish on this? Ah, you're killing me. <laughs> D E as a short? No, no. I mean, first of all, I wouldn't trade it because it's electrocardiogram. But in general, it's going up. Why would you short that, Don? You see, just when I thought he was coming around. Oh, the bear in the woods. Okay, I got you. All right, well, good. F-E-Y-E is good. That's what a stock should look like. T-H. Oh, Steve was saying, I think Steve was saying thanks and not T-H-N-X. Okay, well, sorry I picked on you for that, Steve. Hopefully you didn't leave yet. <laughs> N-X-P-I. Um, longer term, this one's obviously in a longer term trend. Uh, it did gap higher here, but it's, it's kind of like Janet Jackson situation. What have you done for me lately? Uh, so this particular case, it would actually have to break out to new highs and then pull back. So leave it alone for now. But if it breaks out to new highs, on a pullback, possible. Yeah, Howard, I agree with you on the shop. Absolutely. Sup in for Calvin. We're almost done. We took a lightning round. So any anything else you want to know, let me know real quick. We have to shut down the uh, deal soon. Uh, on a pullback, absolutely. Um it's had a pretty serious run in here. Maybe a little bit more knockout. See, this didn't quite enough knockout for me. Uh, but it looks okay. I mean, you've got everything going for you. You've got some acceleration higher. But for me, and sometimes I could be a perfectionist, except when it comes to something like an IPO or a commodity stock. But anything else, especially like a generic drug or something like this, I'm looking for a little bit more perfection. So I'd like a little bit more knockout. But I have to tell you, it's not a bad-looking stock at all, okay? PN, did we cover that one? Don wants to know about Starbucks. Yeah, PN looks great. Um, you know, ideally a little bit more pullback. It's really thin now, okay? And then we got one more, and we'll finish it up. 
Yeah, Starbucks is actually looking okay. I'm not a big fan of Starbucks. HV is kind of low. It's a huge, huge, huge thick stock. It might be worth trading, but then it's kind of like one of those situations where it's a lower volatility stock. It's something bad could probably uh, could always happen. I mean, it's not a great example back here. I was trying to find like a big gap or something in it. But, yeah, it looks okay on pullbacks. But, I, again, I'd probably find something a little bit more uh, exciting than that. Not that we're trading for excitement. Last one, NBL, NMBL for Steve. Yeah, on a pullback, maybe. It's a little squirrely, but I hear you. And it's a toddler. It's a relatively new issue. So, yeah, on a pullback, not bad. And you're getting past all these bad memories back here. So not bad. Absolutely, Steve. Keep that on your radar. That's a that's a pretty good high note to end on. Um, thank you guys for coming. I appreciate you taking time and busy schedule. Anything unanswered, Dave at DaveLander.com. And uh, if it's a short answer, I will answer you immediately. If it takes a little bit more thought, uh, come to the show. Like somebody this morning gave me a couple of good uh, – gave me some fodder for the show. So I appreciate that. Uh, so if we don't talk between now and the weekend, everybody have a fantastic weekend. And uh, I guess I'll see you guys and girls next week. Thank you so much.